Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I was a little late. So I'm Dr. Linda Colley. I'm a GP in the area and a clinical um, director for Portsmouth Place of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care Board. Uh, limited public seating has been made available. However, this meeting is also being webcast to allow the public to attend remotely if they so wish. Please be advised that the public seating area is not in view of the camera used to webcast this meeting. So for safety information, if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble in the turning circle at the end of King Henry Street past the University's Park building. In order to comply with the Guildhall Trust Fire Marshal regulations, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should sign out when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. Uh, may I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed. Everyone speaking via a microphone will be on camera, including those making deputations. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. So if that is for yourselves, please do make it clear. Please can everyone use the microphones and you can move them to uh, be spoken into and remember to switch them off when you have finished speaking. So I'm going to start with the introductions for everyone. So if we start over... <coughs> Kelly Nash and Strategy Unit of the City Council. Matt Gunderson, Head of Strategic Health and uh, Strategic Intelligence and Research, Public Health. Sam Graves, Community Safety Analyst. I thought you were going to ask Anna. Um. Anna Martin, Democratic Services. I'm Gerald Van Jackson, Leader of the Council in Portsmouth. And if we start at the back row, please. Caroline Hopper, Strategy. Ros Hartley, Integrated Care Board for Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Morning all, David Williams, Chief Executive. Morning, Alastair Snell, Deputy Chief Operating Officer, Solent. Sarah Daly, Director of Children and Families Education. Natasha Edmonds, Director of Corporate Services, Portsmouth City Council. David Goosey, uh, Chair of the Portsmouth Adult Safeguarding Board. Joe York, Managing Director, Portsmouth for the ICB and the City Council. Morning colleagues, Andy Biddle, Director of Adult Social Care at Portsmouth City Council. Uh, James Hill, Director of Housing, Neighbourhood and Building Services. Uh, Mark Orchard, Chief Financial Officer at Portsmouth Hospitals, here for Penny Emirates, Chief Executive. Roger Banterbury, Chairperson, Health Watch Portsmouth. Alan Noble, Public Health Principal, Public Health. Dominique Latouz, Assistant Director of Public Health. Helen Atkinson, Director of Public Health. Good morning, colleagues. Diane Sherlock, CEO of Age UK Portsmouth and representing the voluntary sector. Lorna Reevely, the Hive Chief Officer. Matthew Williamson, Cabinet Member for Health, Wellbeing and Social Care and Co-Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, Terry Norton, Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Councillor Lewis Gosling from Copna Ward. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we've had some apologies for absence uh, from uh, Councillor Adinaran, Councillor Horton, or she says she may be late, so we may still expect her. Uh, Superintendent Claire Jenkins, Penny Emirate, but we have uh, Mark here, Francis Mullen, Paul Riddle, and Susanna Rosenberg. Um, so for today's agenda, are there any uh, declarations of interest that need to be reported? No, lovely. So we'll move on to the minutes of the previous meeting, which was, which was held on the 21st of September. Uh, any accuracy issues first of all. So if we start on page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, 
page 9, page 10, page 11. Is everyone happy with those minutes? Are we happy to approve? Oh, yeah. Uh, just a matter arising from them, if you wouldn't mind, Linda. No, um, on page either six or ten, depending on your um, your numbering of them, we did the pharmaceutical needs assessment. Um, but since then, um, my understanding is that the pharmacy on Elm Grove has been approved for closure, even though we said that we didn't want the number of pharmacies to fall. What are we able to do? Because we were very specific in what in what we passed to say the number that there should be. What are we able to do to try to make sure that doesn't happen again? Um, because um, if if we're increasingly relying on pharmacists, but they're increasingly shutting, um, then the pressure on primary care becomes greater and greater. I'm sure Matt has a, a knowledgeable answer. Matt. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as you're aware, there's not a huge amount that we can do in that it's not our decision about pharmacy closures. Um, however, uh, also, unfortunately, the timing of that particular closure, effectively, the closure was based on the previous pharmaceutical needs assessment because at the time the closure was applied for, our new one hadn't been approved. So the recommendation in the new one that we don't want to see any more was not a factor in the decision making around that. I, I'm not suggesting that it necessarily would have made the decision different had it been. Um, what we can now do and what we will have to do is issue a supplementary statement to our pharmaceutical needs assessment that reflects the fact that those closures have now taken place and that there are now um, closures that have happened since we said we didn't want to see any more closures. So there's a decision then to be taken as part of that supplementary statement that could now say we believe there are now gaps as a result of those closures. Um, that's a piece of work that we haven't yet undertaken. We were only notified of the closure in the last few weeks, but we will we will consider that and bring that back to this this board as a supplementary statement. I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Were there any other actions that were needed? No. So we're happy to approve those minutes then. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. So moving on to our first item, we've got Violence Against Women and Girls and Caroline is going to present this. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. This is a noting paper that's been prepared in partnership with Hampshire Constabulary. It's been presented two days before White Ribbon Day on Friday the 25th of November. The White Ribbon Campaign is a global movement working to end male violence against women and girls. Violence against women and girls in all its forms can be life-altering for its victims, and it's important to note that the term VORG refers to all victims, regardless of their gender. However, we must acknowledge the gendered nature of the issue, and women remain disproportionately affected. In 2021, the National VORG Strategy, Domestic Abuse Strategy and Action Plan, and refreshed National Statement of Expectations, brought together the full spectrum of VORG crimes for the first time. Whilst locally data is showing a positive increase in awareness of unhealthy and abusive relationships, domestic abuse continues to be the largest driver of violent crime, accounting for 44% of assaults recorded by police. Reporting of sexual offences has increased since 1920, although the Board is asked to note that this will be driven in part by some things like improved reporting. The paper outlines three key work streams underway in Portsmouth to address VORG the Police Tactical Plan, the Domestic Abuse Strategy and the Safer Streets Agenda. Working in partnership, raising awareness and encouraging a community response run through each of these. The work streams are connected operationally and through governance structures. The OPCC, Office for Police Crime Commissioners, VORG Task Group is bringing partners together at a regional level. There are some emerging successes. The response to domestic abuse has been strengthened by combining three separate contracts into one. Venues across the city have been trained as we stand together safe spaces to respond to those experiencing harassment and sexual crime. Hundreds of people in the nighttime economy have been trained to recognise and respond to issues. Upbringing patrol strategy within the nighttime economy has enabled large numbers of vulnerable people to be safeguarded each night and community protection warning notice warnings are being used to manage repeat perpetrators. And the Safer Streets programme more widely has enabled situational improvements to footpaths and public spaces across the city. 
the board is asked to note that there is still potential for more connected response and this will be considered along the review of existing, alongside the review of existing plans and that we will continue to find ways to bring in other relevant agendas including education, regeneration, culture and leisure to ensure we respond to this agenda with maximum effect. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Thank you very much. Just happy to add that um, in, in terms of the OPCC's drive to bring partners together uh, around VORP, we've got our annual VORP conference on Friday. Uh, I'm sure that uh, some of you have been invited, but um, it's not something that we're live streaming um, because obviously we want it to be quite a, an environment where people can speak freely. But for those uh, attending, please do uh, report back, bring back uh, the learnings of the day um, and do obviously feed into us with um, any ideas and feedback from that. But that's on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I'm sure Karen will have the details of it, but on, on Friday it's white, we're doing the raising of the white flag um, day at the, outside the Guildhall, I think at 9.15. Um, everybody is very welcome to come as a very public symbol of, of, of the support for the campaign. So um, do come along if you would like. Is that right, Caroline? That's absolutely correct. And I was shocked to find it's not in my diary, so I have just sent an email to Nicole to remind her. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No, thank you. And I think it's another example of where you work together, you'll definitely achieve more, won't we? And this sounds like a really positive uh, paper, so thank you. Um, we're moving on to the community safety survey. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm presenting, uh, introducing um, items five and six at the same time. So we're looking at uh, the findings from the Community Safety Survey and also the updates to the strategic assessment uh, of crime and social behaviour, reoffending, substance misuse. Uh, I'll briefly introduce the two reports. Sam's then going to present um, the, the findings from, from both those pieces of work as a presentation, which will be slightly more interesting than me, than me talking, and then we'll come back to the recommendations in, in the two reports at the end together. Uh, so both these pieces of work, as I say, led by Sam Graves, who's a community safety analyst within the Public Health Intelligence team. Um, it's a role funded uh, through the, what we call the Safe Reports and Partnership pot, so from our previous Safe Reports and Partnership work, uh, which is in part uh, funded by contributions from the responsible authorities represented here around this table, so we're grateful for that continued support. Uh, the two reports, the first one presents the findings from the an uh, biannual community safety survey. The second looks at the uh, strategic assessment updates. That's a statutory requirement to produce a strategic assessment. Uh, we do it every three years in full, and then we do an annual update uh, just to kind of review the, the data that's, that's changed in the previous year and identify if there's any priorities that need to be updated or anything that needs to change. So I'll hand over to, to Sam, who will talk you through the slides. Thank you, Matt. Um, can you Next slide. Thank you. So, um, as Matt has said, um, I'll be giving an overview of um, key uh, tri crime trends um, and the key findings from the Community Safety Survey. It makes sense to do them together as actually uh, the survey um, is our key way of, um, sort of consulting with residents and it actually feeds into the, the update that we do. Um, also, for clarity, we've compared um, the financial year of 2021-22 with 2019-20, and that's because the levels of many crimes were lower during uh, 2021 as a result of behaviour changes associated with the COVID-19 restrictions. Thank you. So, uh, the graph that you can see on this slide um, shows the victimisation reported to our local community safety survey in purple along the bottom. And you can see that actually uh, that level has been pretty stable over the last three surveys, which sort of represents um, six years' worth of, of data because we do the survey uh, biennially. Um, police recorded crime um, is plotted in the dark blue. Um, and for the years where we carried out the, crime, the uh, community safety survey, and that shows an upward trend since 2014. And there's been um, just under 10% increase in police recorded crime since 2019-20. But when we look at other data sources, such as our local survey um, and also the crime survey for England and Wales, they suggest a stable trend um, in overall levels of crime, so both locally and nationally. Um, 
And so this leads us to conclude, um, and also by considering other data sources, uh, that the increase in police recorded crime overall is likely to be driven by changes in the way that police have been recording crimes, some new offences over time, um, and also victims having more confidence to come forward and report crimes. And some uh, different offences are also affected uh, greatly by police activity, such as drug um, offences. Um, behind the overall levels, um, the picture is a little bit more complex, but overall we've seen that people are increasingly relying on online platforms for work, shopping and socialising, and this has increased opportunities for criminals to commit cybercrime and also exploit people. Cybercrime can allow criminals to reach a much larger geographical area, literally almost anywhere in the world, and also reduce the chances of being caught for, for the crimes they commit. The Crime Survey for England and Wales has found that cybercrime has increased substantially over the last two years, and data from our local survey also su supports that finding. At the same time, we've seen reductions in theft offences over the last decade, both nationally and locally. Um, and this is likely to be a result of many things, um, including increased surveillance, um, more people have their own personal surveillance, their ring cameras, things like that. People are very quick to take videos and photos on their phones. Um, there's also fast appreciation in the value of uh, technological devices as well. Um, and then this is coupled with the low risk opportunities that are now available um, at, for online uh, fraud and theft offences. With regard to violence, overall, um, we think that the picture is pretty stable. Police recorded violence with injury offences seem to have stabilised now, and also hospital admissions for um, violent uh, assaults and uh, alleged assaults have been stable in recent years as well. But we, do, we have seen some increases in some particular types of police recorded violent crime. So there has been increases in police recorded sexual offences, domestic abuse and stalking and harassment offences. Um, but because we know that a substantial number of victims do not report these types of crimes, it's really difficult to unpick whether these increases are showing a willingness, an increased willingness of victims to come forward and report to the police, um, better recording of those crimes by police, or whether there has been a genuine increase in those types of crime. So now I'm going to um, talk briefly about the Community Safety Survey. Um, we've been doing this survey since 1997 in one way or another, um, but since 2014 We've conducted the survey in-house. Uh, we've recruited, trained um, and supervised students from the University of Portsmouth to carry out the field work. And having the survey running for this amount of time gives us some really great long-term trend data about the experiences of our residents. It doesn't, repl um, doesn't mean that it doesn't rely on them reporting those um, uh, incidents to the police or other services. Sorry. <coughs> um, Levels of antisocial behaviour have been relatively stable since 2014. The types of antisocial behaviour which are causing the biggest problem for our residents are people hanging around, people using and supplying drugs, and noise in the street. And actually, most of those are similar to previous surveys, um, although we have seen an increase in people reporting that they're seeing people using and supplying drugs. The biggest increase we've seen is in traffic-related antisocial behaviour. 5% um, of uh, participants actually mentioned e-scooters and that's a new issue which hasn't been um, mentioned previously. Just over half of participants said that there were areas of Portsmouth where they felt unsafe or they avoided, um, in particular Somerstown and Buckland. But that's actually been the case for the last 20 years that we've been running the survey, so there's been no change there and it's largely due to bad reputation. Um, but there are also concerns about groups or gangs hanging around, dodgy people and drug use or drug dealing. Sorry. Um, also, um, commercial road, particularly at night and South Sea, are increasingly becoming areas that people avoid or feel unsafe. Um, this is, comes back to this, the graph that you saw on the original slide. I've already talked a lot about this. But the surveys found that most types of crime reduced or remained stable, um, and the reductions were offset by a substantial increase in online crime. Um, we, sorry, next one. Uh, we started asking about knife crime in the last survey to link in with violence reduction unit work, um, and we found that this time more participants thought that knife crime was a problem than in the previous survey in 2020, but the experience of knife crime remained stable. 
This time we were also asked to give a particular focus to the safety of women and girls as part of the VORG work that Caroline was talking about earlier. We slightly adapted one of the questions and we included an extra line of explanation encouraging participate, uh, participants to tell us where they felt unsafe, why and what could help them feel safer. We found this was really similar uh, to the responses from men, but that women were more likely to feel unsafe than men, um, and particularly in the city centre um, at night. The reasons they gave were similar too, uh, mentioned, although women were more likely to mention a high crime rate and poor lighting. And we, when we did the training of our, of our students, um, we spent a lot of time um, sort of talking to them about the importance of encouraging the, the participants to give exact locations. Um, and I know for myself, when I did, did some surveys as well, very few participants were happy um, or able to give particular streets or alleys or locations and actually instead just referred to neighbourhood, sort of larger areas. Uh, this is a real shame because if specific locations are mentioned, it's easier to do target work. But it does suggest that actually people's perceptions are more around neighbourhoods rather than actually that one particular space. Um, so we also asked what we could do to help women feel safer um, in the areas they mentioned. And we did get a lot of feedback, um, which is available if you contact me. Um, but they can be broadly broken down into the, the themes that you can see on, on the screen. So uh, now I'll just do a quick review um, of the recommended community safety priorities. If you want to take a, a minute to just read through rather than our read, reading out. So um, although most of the priorities remain unchanged, it's recommended that we actually add in violence against women and girls specifically within the tackling violence priority to reflect the national um, and local focus on the issue. So the first priority was tackling violent crime. Um, it's still the largest known uh, violent, well, sorry, domestic abuse is still the largest known driver for violence and as previously mentioned we have seen increases in police recorded sexual offences, stalking harassment and domestic abuse offences. Um, we can't, while we can't unpick whether this reflects a genuine increase, some national research by Sylvia Walby suggests that some victims or survivors of domestic abuse may be experiencing more severe and fre frequent abuse and violence. And actually, this is supported by local data, which shows an increase in repeat perpetrators and also an increase in those linked to high-risk offences. Meanwhile, we've also seen a reduction in the number of charges for domestic abuse offences and the number of cases um, related to domestic abuse heard in court. So this has really highlighted for us the need to focus on holding medium and high-risk perpetrators to account. And while the volume of violent offences uh, resulting in injury has been fairly stable, we have seen uh, numerically small, but um, still seen an increase in knife-enabled serious violence. Um, there was uh, an increase of 19 offences over the whole of the year compared with 2019-20. And while knife-enabled violence accounts for a small proportion of violent crimes, so about um, 1%, these are potentially high-harm crimes. Um, and also the perception of knife um, crime being a problem has also increased, so a continued focus on knife crime is advised. Number two is about tackling drug-related harm. So increasingly residents who have participated in our community safety survey have been telling us that they're witnessing drug misuse in their area. Um, and levels are much higher than we saw pre-2020 the survey. It's also the second most pressing issue for residents um, ASB issue. Um, I'm going to let Alan tell you more about combating drug works later on because he's, that's his presentation. So um, if you go on to three. Um, early identification of and interventions with children and young people at risk. Um, this, uh, there hasn't been any additional analysis for this because it was just a brief update. But the consequences of childhood adverse experiences and the importance of protective factors are recognised and therefore it's recommended that this priority continues. 
Um, the same for uh, priority four about improving accessibility and capacity mental health provision. Um, there hasn't been any additional analysis on this priority either, but it is recognised that financial stress caused by the cost of living crisis could have an additional impact for some of our residents. And currently the public health intelligence team is putting together a dashboard which will monitor aspects that may be impacted by the cost of living crisis and that information will soon be available. <clears throat> and the final priority is about increasing the awareness of cyber related harm. So I've already mentioned about the increases we've seen both locally and nationally in levels of cyber crime. And this is actually likely to present a permanent shift um, with more offenders taking advantage of these opportunities online, particularly around theft and exploitation. So there's a need for partners to understand how this could affect their service users, particularly those that might be vulnerable to exploitation. Right, and um, so, that's the end of the um, priorities. Um, if anybody hasn't seen the previous full strategic assessment for 2021, that's available on the um, Safe Reports of Partnership website. Um, and, and when this has been approved, the update has been approved, that will also be on there. And the Community Safety Survey full report is also available on that website. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, you Sam. Um, so in terms of the, the recommendations from the two reports, they're essentially that um, you use both the findings from the Community Safety Survey and the update to the strategic assessment in your, in your relevant plans. Um, and then to, in the second report, item six, that we um, agree the changed, uh, the, in, the, the additional focus on violence against women and girls in uh, set out in 1.3 for that first priority. Um, We've, within the council, gone out and talked to all of our directorates about these findings and how the, they can be used by directorates within their work, um, recognising that violence is everybody's responsibility, that crime is everybody's responsibility. Um, we're going out to, to talk to the police about these, these findings um, soon, and I'd, I'd reiterate the offer that if any of you have forums in which it would be useful to discuss these things in more detail, then I'm very happy for myself or Sam to come out and, and talk to you about those. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Gerald? Thanks. I thought that was very interesting. Um, I'd quite like to suggest one additional thing that we should try to have a go at, because it seems to me that fear of crime is as important sometimes in restricting people's lives as crime itself. And I just wonder whether we could have a, a, something that about making sure that people feel safe in their communities or safe when they're going around the city. Um, and I think that's something that both the police, the council, probably everybody can work at. Um, and I think it covers a, a, a range of, of different things, um, um, but including the, the one that was mentioned um, um, about people illegal using of scoot uh, 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 um, scooters around the city, um, because I know that causes a great deal of concern to, to many more elderly residents um, who get frightened of being knocked off their feet. But, but I, just seem to, I think we just need to be conscious that the fear of crime imprisons people in their homes um, and it's, it's, it's sometimes as problematic as the reality. Although I hate to sound like the Daily Mail. <laughs> thank you, Chair, and no, uh, thank you to uh, Councillor Vernon Jackson for his comments. I think, realistically, I think we need to look at, there's some work to be done about around promoting, you know, crime stats and being a bit more transparent with this kind of data, because whilst I hear the comments, I think the reality is most people are, the crimes that most, well, what we're told is the crimes that most people are likely to fall victim to are, are fraud and online crimes, but in terms of the crimes that police attend, it's domestics, it's domestic abuse, and we're going to need to, I think, maybe be quite honest with and transparent with those those stats so that, you know, people, of course people are frustrated about people driving over 20 miles an hour in their communities, of course people are frustrated about e-scooters, but the police are dealing with high harm situations, they're, they're going out and dealing with rapes and murders and, and all of that sort of stuff, and I think if we're a little bit more honest about, without causing too much fear in communities, if we're a bit honest about the work that the police are doing and what they're dealing with, people may feel a little bit more easy when they get frustrated about an e-scooter and, you know, we're looking at stats that say that there are one in ten know of somebody that carries a knife. Now, 
if you were to ask people, do you want your police officers to go and confiscate knives, or do you want them to challenge those on e-scooters, I think the picture would be quite clear. Um, however, you know, in terms of trust and confidence in policing, I think it's a fair comment, uh, and also around police visibility, which is why you know, Uplift is helping you know, a huge way, and I think it's important to, to, to tell you where we're at in terms of Uplift, if that's okay, Chair. Um, so of the six of the uh, 498 that the government have, have given Hampshire and the Isle of Wake for, for additional police officers, and that's a net gain, that's including those that retire and what have you. Um, you know, we've obviously pledged 600. That image is looking more like 637 because we're going above and beyond for those who may, um, you know, not enjoy the force and uh, want to move on, that natural kind of progression. And we've actually asked for more. The government's saying, no, we're not going to give you extra share at the moment um, because, you know, we need to make sure that they go elsewhere as well. But we've hit that 498 uh, and we'll have the 600 in place by um, March of next year, which means that we can now say to the force, you know, don't just become a high harm force. We now want you to go out and look at the category twos, category three situations, the e-scooters e and, and the various other things. Uh, a commitment, of course, has been made to 100% uh, attendance of residential burglaries, uh, and that will help. Um, but I think partnership working is important, and you know we often have. Uh, the police contacted around, you know, 20 miles an hour, people driving faster than that. We often have them contacted around various things that I think partners can play their role in. You know, realistically, is it the police's job to, um, to put road signs up and, and bumps on the roads? You know, that kind of comes under highways and local authorities uh, and things like that. Same with lighting of parks. You know, of course the police will enforce, but whose job is it to light parks? Um, and, and I think it's important to, to say that we have got an ASB uh, task force. The commissioner does uh, have a pots of money that we can put out to councils, to charities, to um, neighbourhood watch groups, etc. If there are some small things that they want topping up with, you know, the odd speed sign here and there, the Z gate, uh, and various things, and we do welcome, um, you know, those. Um, applications coming in, but I'm really, really pleased that the ICS, for one, are starting to look at crime prevention and, and put that on their agenda and various other things. Um, but I, I do think it's a partnership approach. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, Diane. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for explaining that. And I'm 100% I'm with you and 100% supportive of, of the police and police actions and prioritising the right ones. The only thing I would gently request is a um, reserved approach to scams. One of the things we're trying to do very much at the moment, and there are digital champions all over the city, is encourage people that have anxieties about going out to socialise differently. They also have to live differently to access their money, to access food, etc, etc. And the biggest battle we have is being terrified they're going to be scammed, despite the fact that we're teaching how to be on the internet safely. That fear is stopping so many people from participating that way. It's, it's our forever battle, I'm afraid. So there's a fine line between, yes, completely agree, we all want knives off the street, and not terrifying the public about being on the internet. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, you're absolutely right, and it's a difficult one for us, if I'm honest, because it's realistically fighting cybercrime is something that happens from behind a computer. And the public want police visibility; they want to see their bobbies; they want to make sure they get a good service. Um, and I think there is a perception, dare I say, from the public that cybercrime is something that's dealt with up in London in an office somewhere, and it's not really a, a local issue. Um, so I think there is certainly some work to be done around education. We certainly need to look at, I mean, actually the biggest volume is, is things like Amazon packages not arriving where it's, to, to you and I, only maybe five, ten pounds, we may not chase it, but that leads to you know, billions, you know, if you look at the, the amount. Um, so certainly some work to be done. Uh, around education and cybercrime, and we'll, we'll certainly take that away and look at that in terms of you know, when we're rewriting our priorities for you know, potentially a second term and things like that. Thank you. I haven't got my microphone on. My question was linking into the fear. So in here it says Summerstown and Buckland are areas where people most felt unsafe and were avoided. What do the people of Summerstown and Buckland think? Can you get that level of data in terms of how do they perceive their areas? Um, yes, we, we can actually see who's suggested um, what areas, and that is something that I can look into and sort of, um, go sort of beneath. Um, I've got a feeling it will be people who don't live in Summerstown and Buckland. And that helps drive inequality in those areas and things, isn't it? And it's how we can raise the profile of these areas across the city, and that's all of our responsibility. So, Thank you. Was there any other comments or questions? 
No, lovely. So we're moving on to the Hampshire race plan, and Paul's going to lead that one. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, so I just want to give a brief uh, overview to the board on the Police National Race Action Plan. Um, the action plan has been launched by the MPCC and the College of Policing, and it's designed to improve policing for black people. It has the support of all 43 chief constables across the country, and it's something that policing has been attempting to address since the Scarman Report in 1981 and the McPherson Report in 98. And unfortunately, we've had limited impact, and we, we've got to accept that. So it sets out changes across policing to improve outcomes for black people who work within the organisation, interact or are affected by policing and to improve overall trust and confidence. The fact is, nationally, you are disproportionately more likely, if black, to have police powers used on you and Hampshire reflects that. Um, it's an awkward truth that we're being really transparent about and it's something that we're passionate to address. So we also are still not an employer of choice for black people and we're an outlier as a public service and that's an important goal for us to reflect the communities we serve. There's four main work streams for the plan. It's about being represented, not over policed, involved, a real focus on engagement and inclusion when we make decisions and to not under protect black people. There's a PowerPoint that I will share with members of the board um, and I'll plan a further conversation across the partnership to look at the wider issues and develop a partnership response for the city to see if this is wider than, the poli than policing for Portsmouth. It's a priority for the constabulary um, and if you're happy we'll keep it on the agenda and update at the next board progress. Yeah, I think we'd all welcome that. Is there any comments now or questions? I will add, add some to it if that's okay and just to pay credit to some of the work that the force is already doing. Um, I know that the, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Police Force have actually had national recognition and national awards for their diversity and inclusion work so that's, that's really great and there are some extra things that the force are doing in terms of making sure that young uh, black teenagers make sure that they get uh, legal aid when they're arrested you know, access to solicitors and things like that which didn't happen before and, um, and looking at you know, strip search data and, and things like that and, and making sure that um, there, there's lots of is equal there so um, yeah, lots of work going on the force is recognised as, as being a you know, leader in this area um, but of course always more to do and I'm just assuming now that there's good links in with the schools and colleges, are there, in terms of future job opportunities, apprenticeships, etc.? Right, there is. <laughs> However, um, it's difficult, isn't it, in education? Um, and I don't want to paint a, a, a hugely you know, broad picture, but there are areas where there are schools who are still have a very, very closed door approach to external agencies. And I think that may be because of academisation or whatever it is. Um, perhaps it's, it's chasing league tables and what have you, but I think it's increasingly hard for police officers to get into that education space in some areas, not always, but in some areas. So what you're left with is, I think, overworked teachers who teach potentially citizenship, PSHRE as a second or third subject using generic resources, um, maybe not doing them justice because it's not their priority, if, if we're honest. Um, and I do worry that that is leaving gaps in, in education um, and, and, and certainly around policing and county lines and all of those sort of things, certainly race equality. Um, you know, fundamentally, we want more black police officers, those from BAME backgrounds in, in the force. Um, getting into schools and promoting that is, is key to that, um, but there is sometimes a bit of a closed door policy. Um, we have got the force appointed six new schools liaison officers, so we're going to keep track on the work that they're doing and, and, and do all we can to find out are we going into the right schools and are they having trouble getting into schools and if they are, you know, let us know and we can do some work to, to try and work with those schools. Um, but it is an area within education that I think is missing. I still think teachers are best placed to identify children who are overly sexualised or potentially involved in gang culture or bleary eyed or come in with brand new trainers often and therefore may be involved in you know, county lines and what have you. Um, but there is lots of work to be done, I think, with um, education and, and making sure that we, we promote positive you know, trust and confidence in policing among young people within schools because it's the best forum to get them, I think. Yes, Sarah wants to come in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I'd just like to come in in terms of that education piece. We have excellent relationships with, with our schools and, and certainly with the Academy Trusts in Portsmouth um, and through the Portsmouth Education Partnership. So if there are any challenges in terms of that communication or accessing schools, please come to me or Mike Stoneman 
but absolutely I think that our schools would be more than welcoming to engage in this and to support this work um, and from conversations just this week I know that they would relish any support that they can have so certainly outside of this meeting we can take that forward and ensure that we're getting the right access to the right schools. Fantastic, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Oh, thank just a quick one, wanted to tell a good story about police and school interaction. Last summer, um, or last year, I was a carer to my granddaughter and on one particular occasion my, my son, who was a special constable, um, came with me and two police officers were just out the front um, seemingly loitering, which was rather amusing, um, but everyone avoided them and when my granddaughter came out, my son immediately took her hand, took her over to the police police man and woman who were present introduced himself and our granddaughter Evie and next minute they had a crowd around them and the kids just thought it was wonderful and I just thought I'd share that good story because nice stuff is happening out there. Yeah. Right, so I, feel, I feel incredibly negative now that, that's not, that wasn't the intention um, at all um, I don't want to put a dark cloud over it you know, some schools get it very very right yeah. there are some gaps I think that's the important yeah. thing uh, to mention is that there are you know there are still some stories of you know if a, a, uh, some drugs are found in a school potentially saying right we don't want to go to talk about this too much because then we'll have a drugs problem we don't want the bad reputation so I mean that is it's is the case in some areas some schools are, are fantastic and some academies are, are very very good as well but it, it's just not across the board and, and I think what we need to do is highlight the ones who really are focused on what they do inside yeah. and oblivious to everything else that happens outside and there are still some out there who say when you leave this building that's the community's fault that's the council's responsibility you're the public's responsibility we're here to you know, teach you your ABCs. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's back, isn't it, to a police presence. So if people are used to seeing them on the streets, they do then have a chat with them and just come across them in the shopping or wherever they happen to be. So it's a two-way thing. Lovely. Thank you very much. An interesting uh, project, and look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, community Drugs Partnership. Now, Alan. Good morning. <clears throat> I've j uh, I'll be brief. Um, I've. Uh, before you as a report um, to inform the Health and Wellbeing Board of the new Combating Drugs Partnership, its purpose and it, its aims, and we're here to seek approval, or I'm here to seek approval for this um, Combating Drugs Partnership to become a subgroup of the Health and Wellbeing Board and report into it. Just to summarise, the, the Government launched a new drug strategy in December 21. Um, there's a link within the report and, and some more detail on that, but there was there's new funding attached to this national drug strategy, but part of the string attached to the new funding is that we establish a combating drugs partnership in each um, local area, and, to be, and it's to determine the local area um, you're able to, whether it's a uh, upper tier authority or a partnership of authorities, but um, locally we've gone for a Portsmouth combating drugs partnership so the guidance sets out activity that we need to do as part of the Combating Drugs Partnership. We have to have a senior responsible owner, uh, and in Portsmouth that's our Director of Public Health. Um, we aim to bring senior leaders and organisations together to oversee the implementation and meet the objectives of the new National Drug Strategy and to make sure that we use the, the new money that's supposed to be coming down um, to meet those objectives and to work in a collaborative way. Um, the, it's a multi-agency partnership and the membership is detailed in Appendix A within the report. So key responsibilities of the partnership, certainly in the, the short term, we have to produce a detailed needs assessment by the end of this month, followed by a partnership plan by the end of December. Um, so it's, it's been fairly tight timescales because the uh, partnership was only established in September. And then we will be overseeing and coordinating the funding streams which will be coming down um, as part of the national strategy and the, the funding is detailed in Appendix B and uh, as from where we are today it will mean over a million pounds of extra funding by 24-25, um, assuming it does all come down as anticipated. Um, 
The part of the partnership will be to regularly review progress against objectives linked to the national strategy. We, we will need to develop a local partnership framework, and that framework will monitor how we're, how we're delivering and working against the objectives. Um, so our aim is that we will report part annually to the Health and Wellbeing Board on the progress of the plan, of the performance framework, and, and, on, and our sort of more strategic objectives. These will be linked to the national outcome object uh, framework, which is in Appendix C. Um, so we're proposing that we bring um, our, in, to your February meeting, that we bring our needs assessment and the partnership plan um, just for sort of final sign off and approval from the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, but just to say that the, the Combating Drugs Partnership will also be linked to a range of other organisations and other bodies, including um, we're established, the Police and Crime Commission is establishing a Pan Hampshire Drugs Forum where the, the four Combating Drugs Partnerships will feed into and coordinate activity. So just finally, the recommendations then are that you um, approve the health of uh, the combating drugs partnership becoming a subgroup that you will approve um, receipt of an annual plan and progress from the combating drugs partnership mm -hmm. and that you agree to review the needs assessment and the drug and alcohol delivery plan at your meeting in february thank you people's thoughts matt Thanks, uh, and thanks, Alan, for the uh, presentation on that and, and all the work that's gone into setting this up. Um, it was uh, done on extraordinarily short notice. I think it was three and a half weeks uh, between uh, us getting the, um, the, uh, uh, the announcement from the government that these had to be set up to uh, the entire, the entire um, uh, understanding as Alan said about what what the footprint was going to be who the responsible officer was going to be what the membership was going to be all had to be done in extraordinarily short uh, period of time uh, which <laughs> which I know was everywhere in the country had the same exactly the same situation but really was not very um, sensible or conducive um, but under that uh, obviously we've had one meeting already we got our next meeting next week um, and uh, and I'd like to thank everyone involved. Um, this is uh, this is a statutory body. Um, I'm not sure if it's a necessary statutory body, but it is again one that we have to have. Um, and uh, especially as there are already things that are in place uh, on a Hampshire and Isle of Wight level, um, and also some other things that we have those good relationships with the police locally um, and with other services uh, but we have this now um, we are doing everything that's required of us um, and um, we are making sure that we're making it as broad as possible to make sure that we've in, we are involving the right people for what is uh, as I say now a statutory body uh, and reporting. I certainly think the right place for it to be is a sub-board of the Health and Wellbeing Board, reporting into ourselves, as I know our colleagues in Hampshire, the Isle of Wight and, uh, and Southampton are doing as well, um, and making sure that it's got that, uh, it's a statutory body under a statutory body, which I think makes absolute sense, and so it's reporting into us, and as uh, Alan said, it's also, and I'm sure Terry will be coming in in a minute, uh, but uh, you know, coming in with the, with the Hampshire and Isle White Forum, uh, which I think again is a sensible way forwards to make sure that we're coordinating, because as we know, so much of it does go across the lines, but also, and it fits in with what we were talking about earlier with the um, stuff around uh, community safety about uh, we know there are particular issues in the city and uh, and it's right to have uh, it at this level um, where we do have to have this body so we have those concentrations so thanks so much everyone for this and for the report today thank you I, I agree I think this is the right place it's everyone's business and this definitely impacts all of our organizations so it would be the best place to come um, and I'm pleased you're looking at the whole Hampshire piece as well because obviously we don't want to do things in isolation if we can do it more effectively once there but obviously we will have our own more bespoke issues here that we need to address so very welcome the paper and we look forward to February for that Terry did you want to come back in? yeah just to shadow those words really and I think the 10-year drugs plan is is good um, it's unfortunate that it's 
been quite knee-jerk in terms of the time that you've had to set that up, but nonetheless, I think there are some really good, it's, it's the right place for it to be, really. Um, I think it's one of the biggest generational problems we face is this social acceptance around drug taking that and the effect of uh, the internet probably on young people's mental health. And it, it's always the lowest in society who are the highest punished, shall we say. Um, and there's a big problem with, with the middle classes as well and, uh, and their acceptance of, of drug taking, not understanding what the process that it go, we go through to get their drugs to them. Um, so there is some work to be done there. I, I would ask those involved to look at advertising. You know, I think looking back when I was growing up, nobody wore seatbelts in their cars. You know, now, because of a huge national campaign, the Click Click campaign or whatever it was, everybody wears a seatbelt. You know, smoking, smoking on aeroplanes, every, you all know better than I do around how socially accepted smoking was, and nowadays it, it not so much. So there is some work to be done. I think if we can do some, some work on, on, on campaigns, education of course is key to that. Um, and you know, I remember the, the posters in PSHRE rooms in schools and they were very off putting, that sort of stuff I think is, is, is really, really key. Um, let's let the government seize assets, let, let the government go after the, the, the crime gangs and, and take away and cut the head off the snake there. But on a local level, um, you know, there's lots that we can do uh, and I really, really welcome um, what we've heard today and the report really. Um, and please do get involved in the Pan Hampshire Drugs uh, Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh yeah. Well, just a quick thing um, to welcome what's going on. Um, I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago um, uh, with a group of traders who were concerned about um, shoplifter, persistent shoplifting. And for the first time, the offer of residential detox is back on the agenda for people. And that was incredibly welcome um, uh, from people. I know it means working with a very small group of people because you have to work with the willing and it's intensive. But, but to get back to the point that for people who do choose that they want to come off, um, there, is an, there is something now available um, is really welcome. Thank you. So we're all happy to accept the recommendations? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Health and Care Portsmouth now with Jo. Thank you. Yes. Um, and you have a draft of the updated uh, Health and Care Portsmouth blueprint in front of you today, which hopefully is fairly familiar to you all. The blueprint's been, been around since 2015, and members of this board and other partners across the city have been involved in refreshing it. And it sets out our commitment to work together to deliver more joined up health and care services. And we've been refreshing the blueprint in light of the move from the CCG to the ICB, the Integrated Care Board, and the development of the Integrated Care Partnership to ensure that the blueprint now sets out not just our commitments to work together, um, but also how we can look at improving um, and reducing health inequalities in the city through that, that partnership approach. And sort of explains our, our five pillars that we've been talking around, around our priority areas for children, um, people with frailty, long-term conditions, mental health, vulnerable adults, how we, um, and how we manage the market together as well and create that more person-centered coordinated care package. And I'm aware of just, oh, and health improvement and well-being, apologies, the, the main one to miss out. I was desperately racking my brain there, which one I was missing. Um, so I do apologise. And it sets out how we'll come together, how we're using our pooled funds and delegated funding arrangements to support us um, in that and what our priorities will be. And the reason this is a draft is when we took it to the Health and Care Partnership, um, the group that sort of oversees this, really we thought as a done deal actually we thought there are some other areas we want to explore a bit further and really put into um, this document as well as sort of some overarching themes that will sit alongside those priorities. And those are um, workforce, how can we really come together and think about our workforce challenges that we have across the health and care sector, but also how do we do that in a way that really supports local people in employment and 
looks at some of our young people who are perhaps struggling to get into careers in health and care. So we've set up a, a small working group to kind of look at that and think about what solutions can we do locally, how can we work more effectively with local schools, colleges and the university to think not just about the strategic um, developments like the development of the medical school that the university came to talk to us um, about last time in, in the Health and Wellbeing Board, but also some of those more local things that we can do that might make a, a big difference as well. Um, that's one area. And the other area is around what other areas are calling a community empowered NHS and really about how do we harness and optimise the use of the and support that the huge voluntary and community sector that we have in the city can really do to support us in managing health inequalities but also in helping people access health care um, and, and access exercise. So it's things we've, we've tried before, um, looking, at, looking at Diane with, and some of our social prescribing work, but really is there, is there a way we can accelerate and really maximise that now so that it becomes much more mainstream than perhaps the pockets of good practice as well. So I think they're the, they're the two challenges that we've set ourselves in the health and care partnership and, and we want to do a bit more in this document to, um, to just explore that and expand those thoughts. So that's why it's a, it's a draft today and not the, the finished version, but you will see that, that very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments, questions? David? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joe. And I, I really welcome this. I think it's important that, and I know a lot of work goes into it, but I think it's really important that we keep the blueprint up to date and fresh. I think we're, you know, we're in a different health and care landscape, and it gives us a real opportunity to help influence that and we'll come on to that a bit more I think on item 10 um, but it's really important that from place from the health and well-being board we're able to articulate what we're doing why we're doing it who's involved in that how it operates um, and I think you know it, it's important that we recognize that what we're doing is being looked at um, and we're in, in a transitional phase at the moment um, and the importance of the voice of place and the importance of local innovation, creativity, integration is going to be really important in its influence on those other tiers and elements of the new system. So I really welcome this. Um, don't be surprised if we bring it back to you fairly regularly because it's important that we're able to share it uh, with others and engage with others around it. Thank you. Sorry, I'm particularly noisy today. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, Joe, thank you very much for, for reminiscing about reablement and I'm thrilled to be able to say to you in the form of our Close Encounters program, which we have now just received funding for the next four years from the National Lottery. It is alive and well. We offer guided conversations. We're having that, what is a good day for you, bringing people back into their communities. It's very one-to-one -one driven work. So as, as, as Councillor um, Vernon Jackson was saying earlier, it's the intensive stuff at, at ground level that, that builds the swell and it certainly is doing that so we're really happy to share with that work with as many people as I possibly can and um, I'm delighted this is ongoing so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah so I was on a meeting yesterday with uh, uh, other cabinet members for um, adult social care and public health um, around uh, around the southeast region and it every time i speak to colleagues about this i was at the national adults and children's services conference three weeks ago with uh with um andy biddle um and it is it is striking how much our integration um is seen as different how a lot of the issues that go on in other authorities and in other places we 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 either don't see or have a very different perspective on because of our integration. Um, so 
this blueprint I think is great for us to have uh, to have that as a uh, an ongoing position to say how the how the change from the CCG to the um, ICB ports of place is is has changed things, but actually the the most important thing is the continuity, um, because when you're looking at other situations in other places, they want to learn from us and they 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 want to know how we got to this position, uh, because uh, and we know this has been going for a very very long time. Um, uh, this uh, this integration and this work, but this is certainly a when we talk about blueprints often we 're talking about this is a blueprint to use elsewhere we, this is absolutely a blueprint to use elsewhere um, and I think we 're just very fortunate to have the team we have in the city uh, as Diane was, as Diane was saying it, it goes out to the voluntary and community sector as well, um, and it really helps working for the voluntary community sector myself it really helps having that having that single place you can go rather than thinking it's all fragmented and you're all going separately. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't think we can underestimate um, how important that is. As David has said, we're going to hear in the next one about how that fits in with the um, integrated care partnership at the Hampshire and Isle White level, which again is a really important thing in working with our partners. So thank you so much everyone who's involved in this and of course the Health and Wellbeing Board is at the heart of this as well because that brings in that wider spectrum of organisations together uh, which goes outside the sc direct scope of Health and Care Portsmouth but we are indeed all involved in Health and Care Portsmouth. Thank you. Um, so we'll look forward to the future iterations of the paper. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we'll, we'll definitely bring it back and um, pick up some of those that work of the VCS and, and how can we share and develop and sell more of those good news stories because they are out there. We just need to do even more, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know we were going to do integrated care partnership strategy next, but Joe has to leave by half eleven. So if it's okay, we're going to just do the report on dentistry and then we'll come back to the integrated care partnership strategy. So, Joe, do you want to do the dentistry? I believe it's you and Helen, though, isn't it? It's a joint act. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Apologies for messing up the agenda. Um, uh, so, yes, and <laughs> dentistry, as we know, has been a real challenge in the city. Um, and there has been a number of, of workshops and, and conversations around that, some led by um, some of our MPs and, and involving universities, all of which have been really helpful. Um, the ICB, so ICBs took on responsibility for commissioning NHS dentistry, pharmacy and optometry in from July 2022 when, when the ICBs came into into being. So relatively new responsibility for us. Prior to that, um, responsibility for those ser commissioning those services sat with NHS England at a regional level. So the, the move to ICBs is, is really positive because I think it gives us a much better feel and opportunity to look at things with a more local perspective because the, the regional teams, very small regional team and they are quite, it's quite a specialist commissioning and contracting area. Um, and I think it's fair to say that trying to do that at a regional level, the most important thing has been ensuring that consistency, which is, is really important, but within that creates some tensions for what happens in local places. Um, and with a small team, with the best will in the world, they have been unable to develop relationships with providers that can help you move away from perhaps a contractual transactional approach and develop more relationships and understand the local context. So that's the, that's the aim behind the move from NHS England to moving it to ICBs. Very early days for all of us. We're still working very closely with the NHS England team and, and as they are the experts in quite a specialist area, they are continuing to do the work on behalf of the ICBs and we're looking at our governance and delegation around that to ensure that we can get that local flavour into something that's been traditionally much more 
I'm trying not to say one size fits all, but to try and have that real consistent approach across the region, which has been really so important. We can build on that and develop more local options now, I think. So early days in that and how we do that, that doesn't that doesn't sort of take away from the huge challenges that we have across the Isle of Wight, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, around um, recruiting NHS dentists and providing that providing equitable access across the area. And Portsmouth is one of the hardest hardest hit areas in that space, really, because of levels of deprivation. And the work that um, NHS England and Public Health England did before the merger has identified that. So Hampshire and Isle of the Wh Isle of Wight is a priority within the southeast region for improving access, and Portsmouth is one of the priority areas within that, alongside the Isle of Wight, Haven, and Gosport. And, and you'll note from that they're all areas where levels of deprivation are, are an issue. So really important that we work together to look at improving that. We've got a number of procurements coming online that will be due to um, hit from April. Um, we have two in Portsmouth, um, so that's really positive. And again, we're working much more closely to ensure that the mobilisation of that is more successful than perhaps some previous procurements have been um, in the last year or so. We're also doing some real work really closely with Helen around oral health strategy and working with the university to see what more they could do to support us. So there is a lot of work going on. The challenges in NHS dentistry are sort of local, national, regional and national. Um, in part, the NHS co dentist contract from 2006 is recognised to have caused some some perverse incentives in the system in, in all honesty around how people can access and get on to um, take on additional NHS dentistry activity and the pricing around that again has some disincentives with it so that contract is being renewed nationally um, and reviewed and that's they're part way through that now. Um, as I said we've talked about increasing procurement but the biggest challenge again around around for us locally in Hampshire and Isle of Wight is um, that recruitment of dentists. We don't have a dental school locally and we know that people are more likely to stay where they've trained so that that's really challenging. The, we were perhaps quite reliant on EU dentists prior to EU exit so that, that has been challenging for us as well and we're working again to look at how we can do that international recruitment and how can we work with um, Health Education England to make that as easy as possible but also how do we increase the training places so a lot of that is national um, but again trying to work with our local providers and build the relationships and understand their challenges so that we can work with them to resolve them is really important so that's uh, Helen might want to add more about the oral health strategy work thank you Thank you, Joe. So um, the local authority actually have responsibility to work with their NHS colleagues, particularly around leading on oral health promotion. And um, we had a dental summit in Portsmouth in June of this year that was hosted by the University of Portsmouth and chaired by Penny Morden's MP. So there, as well as talking about the complexities of the contract, there were two recommendations that came out from that summit. Um, one, we're currently working with uh, Professor Chris Luca from the Dental Academy on, which is working also with Health Education England and the Dental Deanery. Um, and that is around uh, bidding. So we've got a steering group that will be uh, developing a bid for a centre for dental development, which is not obviously a, a dental school, which is what the University Dental Academy would like, but it is an opportunity to bring uh, more dental students into uh, Portsmouth. So that's uh, we're at the beginning of that piece of work, but um, it's a joint piece of work and uh, 
show myself on the steering group for that but also obviously we have are working closely with NHS England on that as well then the second uh, steering group uh, which has been set up which I'm chairing is a dental well an all health promotion meeting so we have working very closely with the uh, Dental Academy and Professor Chris Luca and Solent Dental Services as well as well as our PCC it's Health and Care Portsmouth and that includes our Health and Care Portsmouth communications team. So we are basically putting, developing a bid to get transformation funding to extend what's already in place in terms of all health promotion in the city uh, because obviously all health promotion is at the core it's the preventative bit or preventing the need for um for uh, acute services or any dental you know dental uh, emergency services so we are already working closely with the dental academy who already deliver all health promotion using their students within some schools in Portsmouth our more deprived schools some care homes and particularly importantly our homeless population who are very have obviously very poor or health um, and or health outcomes so what we're bidding for is to be able to extend that to cover the whole city so all schools all care homes and obviously uh, continue to do the um, the work with our homeless population so that's where we currently are and also you <coughs> might be aware because the most you could argue the most a bit like the seat belts conversation we had earlier and I know this is very, uh, not everybody feels the same about this, but at the moment, uh, probably the most, a bit like immunisation, effective uh, way of uh, having good oral health is actually water fluoridation. Now, at the moment, that it sits or has sat with local government to make those decisions locally, but we're in the final stages of a health and social care bill, which will basically it's going through Parliament now which will give back that decision making to the um, well basically the Chief Medical Officer and the Secretary of State for Health so I think I know it's very controversial and people feel very strongly particularly in this area I know there's been many 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 years but it probably is the most effective way of reducing childhood uh, teeth decay or dental decay so that's also in turn and that's where we currently are but all of this working together is hoping for the improvements in uh, contracting UDAs locally for NHS dentistry as well as the oral health work and I think this is a good example of the Health and Care Portsmouth and the blueprint of us working together to actually get to a shared outcome. Yeah, definitely. Thank, thank you, Helen. So hopefully the report gives you some more information alongside what we're trying to do. Um, I think we have to be realistic in our expectations around dentistry. There are some, some real challenges at every level, but we are working to look at how best we can resolve those, those issues with the new, um, the, new, um, oh, the new responsibilities that have come into the ICB. Thank you. Thank you. Comments or questions? David? Yeah, thank you. I, I, and I think this is a really interesting um, example of how the choice of priorities, whether that's by the Integrated Care Partnership or the Integrated Care Board or nationally, will impact on the delivery of services. And it doesn't quite come out strongly in the report, but there are in this report glimmers of how the current procurement approach directly impacts on the equity of service delivery and you know I think this is going to be a really interesting bit of turf both for the integrated care partnership in terms of how it chooses its priorities and how it interplays with the integrated care board and for the integrated care board in terms of how it interfaces with regional and national policy because my understanding is that the way in which um, the, um, the, the, the units are, are allocated and the way in which the providers are rewarded for those units does adversely impact on those areas of deprivation just because of the complexity of the work 
Um, and, you know, and this, as, as Joe says, this is going to be difficult territory to get into. But if any of the rhetoric around inequalities, um, local choice and influence is going to mean anything, these are exactly the sorts of areas that we need to get into. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, David. And, and you're right. And I think that is a recognised um, downfall or downside of the current contract because it's it's very much, it's the dentists get paid per UDA, per unit of dental activity. And there are, there are sort of set descriptions as to what that includes. The challenge is the harder it is to access dentistry and the less dentally fit a person's mouth is, the longer it takes the dentist to to provide the care so that they're adversely being um, impacted on that because they're having to do more work potentially um, and it's taking longer so they can't see as many um, patients. So there is that, that disincentive that people recognise. I think one of the challenges is how do you put in, in then a local commissioned service potentially like we're able to do quite easily with our primary medical um, contracts and services that re recognises those differences and and that's been slightly more complex in dentistry and some areas have managed to do that a bit more flexibly and a bit more creatively than others but it's absolutely I think where we will need to need to look and, and to work but as Helen said we need to get the oral health strategy right as well so that we are creating more dentally fit mouths particularly in our children and young people and, and I think we need to prioritise that as much as anything. Thank you. Helen wants to come back. Sorry not to labour the point but I do think that David makes a really important point. Um, the reality is you could argue that our population in Portsmouth are almost doubly impacted because we have and it's very clear in the report, we have poor oral health because we have a deprived communities. And the reality is if you look at all behaviours within deprivation, it correlates completely. You know, it's, poor, it's poorer diet, higher sugars cause oral decay. We've got higher levels in our population. And it's also, and I suppose this is just the important point in terms of the um, NHS commissioning, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily intentional, but unfortunately health inequalities are then greater because accessing those NHS services are more difficult. So the majority of people in the country who can afford to pay privately for a dentist will and those that can't unfortunately will be almost doubly affected and I suppose it's a good lesson for us in terms of thinking about uh, access and health inequalities it's not just about access although that's really important it's also understanding those communities and why you know those behaviors uh, take so court but you know are worse and of course we need that oral health strategy but it's also the hardest communities to reach to make those changes so I think it's just important lessons for us when we think about commissioning any service it's almost the double inequality of not being able to access as, as well as also those poorer behaviors and that's not to stigmatize which I think I recently I can see we've got our um, Portsmouth uh, pensioners in the audience I recently uh, presented some similar work and it does look like we're stigmatizing when we call these things out we're not stigmatizing we're just raising those issues because we do need to deal with them and we have to think about how we deal with them so I'll, I won't labor the point anymore no I, I think you're absolutely right Helen and I think it's really visible and obvious in, in NHS dentistry and, and coming new into that because I'm leading the um, the development of pod pharmacy optometry and dentistry across the Isle of Wight um, as well so and, and, and I did that to put myself forward for that because I knew it was such an, an issue for us locally it, it's very visible with the the levels of deprivation and, and access and 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 how that can disadvantage people is probably not as visible and obvious in some other areas of our commissioning. So we really do need to be aware of it. And we've seen it again, haven't we, with the COVID vaccinations as well. Some of the most most deprived in our community really struggled and, and didn't come forward. And to 
really get that 20% of people who would have benefited from the COVID vaccine. We had to work differently, harder, just just engage with those communities in a different way. And I think they're really valuable lessons for us that we need to learn because there'll be other examples that won't be as visible as those. And we're, as you say, probably disadvantaging people because we're making access harder by just having a, a sort of a, a standard offer. Thank you. Any comments or questions? No, thank you very much, Joe and Helen. Brilliant. So now we'll go back to Ros, who's coming to present the Integrated Care Partnership Strategy. Welcome, Ros. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take it that you've read the slides, but I'm just going to pick out a few things and then take some questions, if that's okay. Thank you very much. So just as a by way of quick introduction, um, part of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight integrated care system is to establish an integrated care partnership. And that's where partners across the whole system come together and are mandated to work together to improve the health and well-being of our whole population. The immediate task the integrated care partnership has to do is develop an integrated, sorry, an interim integrated care strategy by this December. So that's happening across the whole country. We all have to submit an interim integrated care strategy by the end of December. So I'm just going to just quickly take, take you through what we've been doing and some of the themes and priorities that are coming up um, out of that strategy before we submit it. So over the last few months, we've been working with all our partners across the system, or as many par partners as we possibly can, and our stakeholders to develop the strategy. But really building on what we've already done over the last few months and years, whether that's through our joint strategic needs assessments, all the work of our health and wellbeing boards, some of the, insi in the insights and data that people have shared with us, and some quite large engagement events that we've had as well over the last few weeks and months, which is great to say I can recognise some of these pe people here who've actually been involved in that. So when we've collectively developed the strategy, we had a number of principles which we co-developed and co-produced together about what was important in coming out up with what we were going to focus on. And some of those things were around let's support what's already happening in the local places. So taking into consideration things that you've already spoken about today, the blueprint, the health and wellbeing board priorities, what's already happening out there. We also said one of the principles were let's, let's instead of having hundreds of priorities, as we often do in, in lots of organisations, is let's focus on a few. Let's really try and get a few that will make a difference. Um, the, another principle is around let's not duplicate what's there, but how do we do have that added benefit of doing things together at a wider scale? So all the things that you've been discussing today for Portsmouth are really important. How does the integrated, the interim integrated care strategy support some of that? How is it evidence-based and what's really in our gift to change? So if it's not in our gift to change, let's not do it. So some of the themes that are coming up, which are in your pack, it's on page 66. We've tried to put the strategy on one page, which has been a challenge in itself. But um, on page 66, we've um, got the what the priorities are how, that are emerging for our interim strategy. And there are five main priorities or themes. One around children and young people. One about how do we improve mental well-being. Thirdly, how do we support people to build the health, happiness, wealth and well-being? Fourthly, what do we need to do to support that? And we've said some, something around our workforce. We know our workforce. We've just spoken about it in several of the items today. Workforce, we absolutely know we've got to have a strong, um, um, motivated workforce in order to, do, to deliver what we want to do. And how do we improve our digital data, insights, um, digital inclusion in everything we do. So those are the five themes that are, that are coming out and are emerging. 
And those are the themes that will be the format of our strategy, our interim, and I keep stressing it is interim strategy. We can change it, we can flex it as we go, go through, but let's go with a few themes for a start. So the next steps um, for us are now testing back with yourselves and our, our, our wider partners and get an agreement to the direction of travel, even if we haven't completely nailed everything. We've got a number of meetings over the next week or so to really, really firm this up and agree the, um, a longer document, which will be finalised today in terms of that draft, so we can, we can share that. And then, of course, in a way, the real work will start after Christmas in the new year about how do we make, how do we really start delivering and what do the, um, what are we going to do together on these five themes that will really, really make a difference and support the work that you and other areas are already doing on, on place. So I guess just to summarise from my perspective, this is an opportunity to look at things differently across the whole population, supporting health and well-being, improving outcomes, reducing inequalities, all those things you've spoken about. It's an opportunity to focus on those few big things that will make a difference rather than having hundreds of priorities. It's an opportunity to do things together that will also support place, so together across our care and our health partners. I think we've got to be really cognizant that as well as the long-term priorities, we know we have got short-term pressures. We, we have all got those um, in our organisations and um, in our lives. Um, and I guess finally, it's just an opportunity to say thank you for everybody who's engaged in this so far. And I hope this is the absolute start of, where, where, of our journey in order to make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Roz. Any comments or questions? David. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think I'd, I'd just like to um, thank Roz and her colleagues for the effort that's gone into this. I think, um, as I touched on earlier, it's an interesting transitional time at the moment. And you know, I think it's quite interesting when you look at those five priorities. They're all incredibly laudable priorities. I think what's interesting is when you look at the emergence of those priorities and you look at the, the, those groups and those individuals that have had the greatest opportunity to influence those priorities, what we're seeing are the priorities in part that people don't feel are getting sufficient voice through other bits of the system. Um, and I think that's quite an important thing for us not to lose sight of because if we're not careful we'll end up with the ICP voicing those bits that tend to get missed but they're in the white papers every time but they're not necessarily at the forefront of the delivery nor the spend um, and then we'll have other bits of the system that are getting on with business as usual spending all the money um, on the acute services or whatever it might be and we'll end up with the two bits of the system that should be coming together maybe beginning to drift apart um, and I think that's why it's, it's valuable that we treat this as a transitionary stage um, you know you can't disagree with any of those priorities they're great but the most important bit is the wiring between the parts of the new system. How is it that the ICP influences the ICB in terms of how it spends, what is it, 3.3 billion? You know, we're not spending a lot of 3.3 billion on those priorities. Um, so how is that influence going to develop over time? And how is the ICB going to influence up the chain? Because the ICB will be driven by the constitutional priorities none of which I believe may be the digital, but none of which are in those five. So, you know, I think that's one for us to continue to engage in. And it's really important that the health and well-being boards and the places have their, get their voice heard in this debate. And it's, all, it's equally important that the ICB is alive to that as well as, and is engaging 
in it. And amongst that will be these issues about equality. You know, we talk a lot about inequality, but we don't really know what we mean when we say it. It sounds right. Um, but I think we need to get into the detail of that so it actually begins to influence how we allocate our resources. And that is going to be a real challenge because there's not going to be a lot more resource around. So this is going to be taking away from some areas and redirecting to others. And that is going to be a struggle. But we've just got to make sure that we get our, our local voice, both for Portsmouth, but also the voice of place in an integrated way um, into that debate. And I think just the other thing is, there's a statutory obligation, not just for the ICB to have regard to the partnership strategy, but also the local authorities. And I think that's really important. I think we just need to continue to emphasize that. It's the ICP's strategy, not the ICB's. Yeah, thank you. Matt. Thank you. And, um, I, I think Dave, uh, Davey's just brought up something that's really, where is he? Really <laughs> critical, um, uh, which is about the, the, f the fact that the integrated care boards are effectively, st on a statutory basis, going to be pulled in two completely different directions. Because they're, they're um, depending on the strategy, which, as he said, comes from this partnership, and I think the partnership as you've seen within the uh, within the papers, um, uh, is is very broad. So I think there was, I think at the meeting, I think Ros at hundreds, hundred people, over a hundred people were at the meeting in um, which took place last month. I think it was, um, uh, which was all about, which was is where this is jumping off with the strategy going forwards. Um, so they have a statutory responsibility to. Um, adhere to the strategy that comes from the partnership but then of course they also have the stuff that comes from Whitehall and comes from the uh, so the priorities of the government but also the priorities of the NHS as a uh, NHS England as a corporate um, uh, body and again this is something that came up quite a bit at the at the National Adults and Children's Services Conference is that uh, we actually had the chief executive of the NHS talking a lot about what her priorities were, um, which doesn't really help when they they don't appear to have anything to do with the strategy that is going to come out from all of these integrated care partnerships, which is very much on that prevention side and on, on that wider population health. Um, Thus, actually, it makes all this all the more important in terms of those priorities. Uh, and as David said, it also then feeds in to our priorities as a council because um, as a local authority and as a local health, uh, health and care system because, of course, um, a lot of that, and this is the thing about integration, is the funding comes from... Uh, a lot of that funding comes via the ICB. So um, the engagement has been really good. Uh, as I say, over 100 people at this meeting last month, um, which was uh, really positive, uh, making use of lots of partners, including the voluntary and community sector. Um, and, and again, it has this real opportunity to inform the board of which we have two members on it here with, with David um, uh, and um, Sarah. Sarah. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Had a complete mind blank there. Um, and, uh, uh, but also with our other local authority members on there, which are uh, from Hampshire um, and Southampton. So this really is important stuff and how it fits in with our health and wellbeing strategy and how it fits in with our priorities as Health and Care Portsmouth cannot be underestimated. Um, so working together with our integration is a really important way forwards because we can have so much influence and input on this because of our positive things that we're trying to do. 
which can then also work on to say what's positive and what can work together well for the integrated care partnership, the integrated care board, and therefore that wider integrated care system. So um, I, I've got a meeting with Ros um, later today. Uh, we've got our meeting next week of the partnership um, to come up with this uh, interim strategy for December. But be in no minds, this is this is interim, this is ongoing, this is something we're going to have be having input in from Portsmouth, working with our partners across Hampshire Isle of Wight. Uh, and I think the onus is also, certainly for myself, is uh, when talking about this with my fellow health and wellbeing boards, chairs across the piece and cabinet members for health, wellbeing and social care across the piece as well. Um, as well as our partners at the districts and boroughs in Hampshire is really important for us to work together because all of this is about wider determinants, all of this is about the broadest nature of our population health and, and, and well-being and I think the onus is on that, it really brings home again that this is about everything in our communities, it's not just about um, what goes on at your GPs, at your hospitals, um, and and in the social care system, it's much much broader than that. So, um, thanks for all the work that's going on. Looking forward to the work that's going to be going forwards, and I, particularly from the Portsmouth point of view, um, look forward to us as a health and wellbeing board continuing to have a lot of input. Um, getting the reports back and giving our feedback and also through our members who are on this board who are on the um, integrated care board in terms of putting those putting that, that those um, things we come up with and the priorities that we have here and across Hampshire and other whites going to that as well. Thank you. Gerald? <laughs> Very quickly, I want to disagree with David. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not interested um, in um, equality on everything. Um, and I think we have um, in this area a significantly better service of integration between health and social care. Um, all the reports I get from the hospital is that we get people out of QA quicker and better and faster um, in Portsmouth and from Hampshire um, and I don't want to lose that. I don't want the ICB to drag us down to the lowest level, common denominator that is Hampshire. Um, I don't want them to drag us down to a worse service. Um, so I'm not interested in equality. I want us to keep having a really good service for Portsmouth residents and I think we should be fighting hard for that. If we can drag the county up to Portsmouth levels, normally kicking and screaming, great. But I'm sorry, David, I'm hoping that you and Sarah and everybody else at the ICB board is going to be fighting our corner for our residents to make sure that they keep the better service that they get from being in Portsmouth, from being in Hampshire, and we shouldn't tolerate being dragged down to the levels of equality of poor service that happens in Hampshire. Well, um, yeah, that's why we need to understand what we mean by inequalities and when we talk about that, do we, are we talking about outcomes, are we talking about inputs, what are we talking about? That's why we've got to be really clear about these things. Personally, is that, David, if you're somebody in a hospital, it's outcomes you're interested in, it's not inputs. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Ros, for coming. I would encourage, there's emails on the bottom of your presentation, isn't there? I would encourage anyone who's got views to email and put your views across because that's the paper's going to be written, isn't the strategy's got to be developed, and that's your way of getting input if you're not going to any of the other events that are held. Thank you. Um, social value report. Natasha is going to speak to that, I believe. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. Um, the purpose of bringing this paper today is to begin a discussion about how a, a citywide social value approach can support the Health and Wellbeing Board to deliver the joint health and uh, wellbeing strategy. Uh, so just a bit of uh, background, the City Council introduced a social value policy in March 2021. 
Um, the three key areas of impact the policy focuses on are social, so improving physical and mental well-being, reducing poverty and social isolation, addressing inequalities, there's that word again, um, economic, so opportunities for local SMEs, uh, greater inclusion of the voluntary and social enterprise sectors in our supply chains, upskilling future workforce, um, and sustainability. So, for example, um, improving air quality, uh, working towards our, our, our carbon net zero goal. Um, so those are the key areas of impact that work the policy focuses on. Um, the approach that we've adopted over the last 18 months since um, adopting the policy are focusing on input, uh, sorry, impact rather than output. Um, making sure that our suppliers understand uh, the social value principle so that they're just demystified and, and making sure that there is appropriate guidance for them. Making sure the approach is proportionate and relevant and targeted to our local need. It emphasises partnership and incentivises compliance with social value commitments through reward and recognition rather than through any punitive measures. So, over the last 18 months, we've developed a toolkit and we've implemented that uh, and applied it to um, about 18 large contracts um, across the, the City Council's procurement. And we've secured social value commitments against all of those based on local need, um, uh, which details of the, of that are set out in the report. Um, but when applying a financial proxy, these have a value of about £20 million pounds, um, in the city. So we're now looking to broaden the approach to social value, um, particularly in line with the objectives of the health and wellbeing strategy. Um, we note that it, you know, it explicitly acknowledges the role of social value in addressing some, some of the wider systemic challenges in the city. Um, and we also recognise that social value in the city can be even more effective um, if it represents a way of work that that all city partners can, can sign up to and embrace, obviously as much as organisational uh, policies and procedures allow. So we'd welcome a discussion um, on the opportunities that a wider social value approach could bring, uh, particularly building on the uh, experience and good practice that the board partners are able to bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Helen? I think this is fantastic, <laughs> Natasha, work. And it, it feels it's very much aligned in with the health and wellbeing strategy, both in terms of what we've said we're going to deliver as a partnership. Um, but it also, for me, underpins the ethos of how we've agreed that we'll work together. So it, I think it would be really great to bring it back to a development session, which I, I note is in your paper, for further discussion uh, when we all get together to actually look at how we're delivering the health and wellbeing strategies, how we are all taking responsibility for each of those priorities within our, you know, we are the biggest organisations, employers, and employing local people in the city. So we're, how we decide how we're going to do our business together has such an impact on everything we've talked about today in terms of the health and well-being outcomes of our residents, everything that's in the ICP strategy. So it's a real opportunity to get together and actually look at how we can perhaps share. And uh, we had a really good session, a last development session, around how we are all going to take responsibility for our poverty priority and how we can all, as in anchor institutions, have an impact on that. And I think this would be the next and I'm, I'm aware it's work that's already underway in other parts of the partnership we had the um, we had the, the brilliant summit last Friday morning the climate change summit which fits very nicely into this and actually everything that we need to deliver for that and for social value is completely aligned so I think it would be a really good opportunity for us as partners to get together and work out how we're going to roll this out because I'm aware actually also looking at Mark who's right in front of you that it's one of the things that, you, that Mark presented at the climate change in terms of the work they're doing at the hospital so I, yeah I think it's a really good piece of work oh, Matt. Um, this came up at Cabinet yesterday, uh, so I'm just going to say very quickly, uh, just, just on this forum as well, this has been four years in the making, um, it's, it's uh, been a huge amount of work uh, that's gone on to do this. Um, 
I know that uh, uh, colleagues, colleagues at the council are um, rightly proud of what we're doing, really moving to a Portsmouth model of social value, uh, and we want that to be something that people, a bit like we were talking about before with our integration, where people can see and learn from it uh, across the boards um, and, uh, and, and more broadly. And, and I, I've said particularly uh, something that I, I think that since the procurement rules have changed for, com uh, for contracting and commissioning, um, by the government uh, a couple of years ago. This gives us much more scope as well to, as has been shown in the report, about being able to base um, uh, contracting decisions on social value considerations rather than just on value for money, which under the old procurement rules uh, was, was all we were able to base things on. Um, so it, it just gives you, it, it's just an idea of, apart from anything else, with all the other things, it really gives you the opportunity to make some really sensible decisions based on actually what's best for the community rather than just what can, what can you do for the cheapest price, which, uh, as we know from um, under the previous rules, really did, uh, and these government bodies in general, uh, to some really poor outcomes. So um, on that side, I'm, I'm particularly pleased that's, that's uh, coming through. But also, let's let's be able, hopefully, be able to be talking about this Portsmouth model, and it being adopted and saying this is something we want to take forward um, nationwide. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Apologies for lateness, but I'm glad I got here in time for this item. And thank you, Natasha, for um, outlining it. Um, I just want to add a couple of things, probably building on what other people have said, what Helen and Matt have said. I think what we need to do is move it from a policy into practice, and that's quite difficult for something that seem, it seems a little bit abstract. Anything to do with values tends to take people into this kind of abstract kind of world. Um, the way I see it is there is a massive need in the city and there's also a massive will to give. And this is both by residents but also by local organisations, whether they're big or small. And I think what this can do is bring those things together if it's done well. I think examples help because, again, going back to the abstract nature of it, there's a procurement side, but then there's all the other things that can be done which would make such a difference to people who, who um, you know, in, in the city who could either need it or, or other organisations who could benefit from it. Um, and I think what happens is sometimes the pressure on everyone to keep surviving sometimes allows that space for creative thinking or different thinking to kind of be pushed out and I think having a policy which would be built on with loads of live examples will help people um, engage with it more and then I think it will snowball because it's um, once it's understood and embedded um, it's a positive thing for everyone. Thank you. Yep, Gerald. Just very quickly, um, if anybody else wants to steal it for their organisation, they're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. As long as they call it the Portsmouth model. <laughs> yeah. right. So, um, Kelly, the suggestion was that we would have a development session on this. Are we happy to schedule one in? I think that would be quite useful. Again, with some live examples and how it works. And... Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Um, Dominique, for the last two items, are over to you. So we're doing air quality, I believe. Is that right? Thank you. I'm going to pass over to Mark to deliver the next item on air quality. Thank you. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. And thank you to Helen, actually, for mentioning last week's uh, Portsmouth, uh, it was Portsmouth Green Partnership Charter that was signed in this very building last Friday, which I think was a, a big moment for the city, actually, in terms of bringing together Portsmouth City Council, the University of Portsmouth, uh, the International Port, the Naval Base, Hive Portsmouth, Portsmouth Hospitals, uh, NHS Trust, in terms of making a number of commitments around this bigger agenda. So, no, thank you. It's good to recognise that. Um, so, the purpose of this paper, which uh, Dominic's actually authored, so thank you, Dominic. I'll, I'll present it, but I know, so thank you for, for, for um, the time you've taken for this. 
Um, the purpose of this one is to update the board on the air quality and active travel priority of the health and well-being uh, strategy. And, and I'm going to make some recommendations at the end. There are four or five things we're looking to um, seek the board's approval on the board members' approval on behalf of their organisations on today, if that's okay. But first of all, just a brief reminder that air pollution is the largest environmental risk um, to public health in the United Kingdom. And we know that air quality affects everyone, but again, back to inequalities. Um, we know that there's inequalities in, in, in exposure in terms of uh, the greatest impact against, um, for, uh, in terms of air quality, if it affects the most vulnerable, affects children, affects the elderly, affects those suffering with long-term health conditions, and it particularly affects, uh, obvious thing to say, those living close to uh, main roads and trunkways. Uh, our Charles Dickens ward is significantly affected here, and we have significantly worse than average rates of emergency hospital admissions for COPD at the local hospital uh, for uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, and the number of under 25 year olds that um, are admitted to our emergency department for asthma as well. So, um, so it's a significant issue nationally, it's a significant issue locally, um, and then obviously one of the reasons why we're prioritising this. Uh, the main source of air pollution, not surprised to, uh, to know in Portsmouth, is road traffic. Uh, there are other um, um, uh, reasons and, and sources and those are itemised in the paper there but the main one is uh, traffic and that's probably the, the biggest focus therefore for, for, for this forthcoming period against others. So reducing car travel um, increasing what we call active travel, which is walking, cycling, bus, using the train and so on, are all obviously priorities to ensure that we can make a real difference for our, uh, for our community. So um, actions then to tackle that. So we've got a multi-agency air quality and active travel board that was established back in February. Uh, that has met several times, I think it, it meets monthly. Um, we've, ha we've conducted a mapping exercise to map the actions that individual institutions are taking and to seek best practice across those institutions and really just do a bit of a share and learn. Um, we had a two-hour workshop with members in September, so just recently, where we developed a plan, a delivery plan for the coming year, and there's several objectives within that, um, which include public awareness campaign to ensure that uh, our communities are fully aware of the impact of air pollution, the health risks that are linked to air pollution. Um, as part of that, we are seeking to use clinical champions, uh, not just from the hospital, but from primary care, uh, from community care also, uh, particularly to, um, to again, part of that awareness campaign um, and to support um, a public engagement on the use of alternative travel um, across, our, across our city as well. Um, we're looking at supporting member organisations to continue to peer support and share good practice um, and as we heard last Friday you know, there's a significant amount of good practice that we can share locally and we can make a real difference on actually so, um, so, so again really 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 important event last week and we've made a commitment also to coordinate our electric vehicle infrastructure so that we can share um, infrastructure amongst uh, parties as well so that's, that's a real positive step forward. So then to the role of the Health and Wellbeing Board Again, reminding us that air pollution is the greatest uh, environmental threat to health. We're asking board members for four things today, other than noting the report that's in front of you. So four things, please, um, for board members uh, on behalf of their organisation. So first of all, to commit to sharing electric vehicle charging points for staff across member organisations and to make that a, a real um, positive active declaration. Uh, second thing is to commit to producing active travel plans within the next 12 months. Now some have made good progress but uh, others have got more to do but we want all of our anchor institutions and all of our partners to uh, develop their active travel plans within the next 12 months which will then inform an integrated travel plan for the whole city. So that's the next stage, that's really an important stage but first of all we need the individual organisations to, to work together to develop their own. Um, we're asking all NHS members, not just the hospital but also community primary care to uh, commit to providing clinical champions to really promote the, 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 um, the, the uh, direct impact on health. Um, and then we're asking for all partners to also commit to developing staff wellbeing champions also to promote um, clean air and active travel. And I think if we can commit to those four things, which um, are ho hopefully easy things to commit to, um, then we'll be making a big step forward in terms of supporting the work of this group and, uh, over the course of the next year. And obviously in return for that, obviously, clearly we will keep coming back with um, regular updates for this board in terms of the real outcomes we'll be able to make for our community as a re in, re in return for uh, this, uh, these genuine um, steps forward that we're making together. Thank you. Anyone want to 
have any po points into that? Any comments? I just like, I mean, it is a really important agenda, and it's not just for air, you know, air quality and respiratory, but you think of your active travel, it's the effect on obesity and all of the wider things. Mental well being is better if you're out in the fresh air and things. So I think it is a bigger strategy than even that's in the paper, but very welcomed. So are we happy to commit to those recommendations? Yeah. Yeah, yeah lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now it's Dominic, <laughs> in terms of reference for the Health Protection Board. Thank you, um, and I will keep it brief because I'm aware we're, we're short of time towards the end of the meeting. So um, the final item on the agenda around the Health Protection Forum in terms of reference. So the Health Protection Board was established in 2020 um, in response to, to the pandemic um, and went weekly during the pandemic with a range of partners, health and other partners um, around the table. It was invaluable really <clears throat> supporting um, the other health protection structures um, uh, in the system. Now that we've moved to a new phase of living with COVID, um, we need a refresh of, of the board um, and um, moving towards um, a more of an all hazards approach. So the three purposes really of the board in terms of health protection practice, the aims are to prevent, assess and mitigate um, threats and risks to human health um, arising from both communicable diseases but also environmental hazards as well. Um, things like chemical hazards, um, natural events, heat waves, flooding, etc. Secondly, um, the purpose is um, delivery of health protection services really needs that close partnership working across a number of partners, not just those charged with it as their day-to-day -day business. Um, not just the UK Health Security Agency, the NHS, but also lo local government partner organisations, the police, fire and so on. Um, and so the Health Protection Board really aims to offer that kind of local platform for information sharing between those um, agencies and, if necessary, taking coordinated action on those um, health threats. And as to reflect that information sharing um, purpose, we've proposed renaming it um, a forum rather than a, than a board. Um, so, as I said, we're sort of broadening the remit in line with um, UK Health Security Agency and government guidance to include an all-hazards approach, um, including not just COVID, which we'll continue to work on, um, but also all communicable diseases, um, including um, growth and spread of antimicrobial resistance, um, and including those environmental hazards that I mentioned, um, chemical, biological, radiological, um, and those also outlined in the Hampshire and Isle of Wight um, Local Resilience Forum Risk Register um, that include, but are not limited to, flooding, heat waves, poor air quality and low temperatures and excess cold. Um, so the terms of reference um, include some membership. Since the publication of the papers for this board meeting, um, we'd like to add Head Health Watch to that list um, to make sure that patient voices are adequately represented. And the accountability remains the same of the, of the forum um, that, that will come to this board um, and its statutory role to bring together key partners um, in the local health system. Thank you. Is everyone happy with that? Any comments or questions? No, I think we're very happy with that. Thank you. And that, with one minute to spare, brings us to the end of the agenda. Thank you for all of the efforts going into the agenda items today. Very interesting conversations. And the date of the next meeting is, I can't remember, it's on the bottom. Yeah, it's not on here. 15th of February, we believe, so we'll see you all then. Thank you very much.